In my last video, I talked about two things God's Not Dead 2 did effectively. In short, its opening managed to insinuate a lot through visuals, and it cleverly misrepresented complaints of church state violations by teachers. However, I also alluded to some miscalculations made by the filmmakers. So now comes the fun part, where I discuss these miscalculations and how they ultimately derailed the movie. Now each of these points speaks to the quality of the film and might be interesting in that regard, but more importantly, looking at what the two movies succeeded or failed at doing reveals a lot about the workings of Christian propaganda pieces and how they interact with our audience. That said, let's dive right into it. Number 1. It gets the characters all wrong. Now yes, the characters in God's Not Dead 1 were over-the-top melodramatic stereotypes. But they were effective over-the-top melodramatic stereotypes. Most famous, of course, is the main villain, Professor Radisson. Now while I hate this character and how he portrays atheists, there's no denying he's a total bad for the trashy purposes of this movie. He struts around chewing the scenery with an almost maniacal energy. All his gestures and expressions are spectacularly overacted, and as we peel back the layers of his character, because we do learn things about his history and personal life, albeit in terms of crass stereotypes, we slowly discover the raw pain and hatred of God that he hides behind his swagger. Why do you hate God? Because he took everything away from me. Because he took everything away from me. All the while, Christians get a cheap thrill from watching him come unhinged in the face of basic apologetics. By contrast, God's Not Dead 2 gives us... Uh... Hold on, let me check real quick. Pete Kane? Huh. I guess that's the name of that character. An ACLU boogeyman who I guess checks off most of the boxes for an atheist villain by sneering and scheming and looking like the devil on the Grinch had a baby that grew up to be a lawyer but he does it all in a low-key way that feels boring and obligatory. Seriously, try to think of one memorable scene he was in. He was never outrageous or energetic, and we learned literally nothing about him over the course of the movie. As much as a villain carries any movie, and as much as these movies sail on the wind of vivid atheist stereotypes, this was a pretty serious flaw. And the movie even managed to trip over the simple task of creating a basic Christian hero. In God's Not Dead 1, Josh Wheaton starts as a naive, idealistic Christian with a heart of gold who stares like a deer in the headlights when faced with persecution, but then eventually gathers his courage and stands up for his faith. Under attack by the world, he not only just says no to atheism, but studies real hard, totally owns Radisson in a debate, and shouts, why do you hate God until he breaks down? Watching this transformation from mild-mannered Christian to persecution-resisting beast, while fantasizing that that's what they do under persecution, is a big part of the payoff for Christians. In God's Not Dead 2, however, Grace, let me look it up, Wesley, also starts as a naive, idealistic Christian with a heart of gold who stares like a deer in the headlights when faced with persecution. But instead of growing at all, she just keeps staring like a deer in the headlights for the rest of the movie while her lawyer... Jesus Christ, do I have to look all these people up? Tom Endler does all the fighting for her. Seriously, these names don't even ring a bell in hindsight. While she makes the initial decision not to say sorry for... uh... uttering the name Jesus, we don't get to see her fight her own fight, and thus Christians never get to live vicariously through her like they do with Josh. Even at the climax of the story, all she does is sit there and cry while Tom wins the day by verbally abusing her for her own good in a ploy she's not even in on. Making your hero this kind of impotent non-factor is just fatal. And the fact that this movie pits someone as blah as her against a dull villain like Kane accounts for a lot of why it's so boring. As a wise man once said, you might not have noticed this made you bored, but your brain did. I guess there's nothing too fatal about the rest of the characters. Pat Boone was annoying and said obnoxious things about atheism, but that probably served the movie well. For a non-believing outsider, Tom is distractingly quick to spew evangelical activist catchphrases, but I imagine that goes right over the intended audience's heads. 
And while Brooke made me feel disappointed in the actress from the Goldbergs, that's neither here nor there, so let's move on. Number 2. Instead of showing, it tells. And tells. And tells. Until you're so bored you want to shove a pine cone up your nose just so you can experience something. Now this is pretty basic, but it's a core problem with this movie as it goes on. I mentioned last time that God's Not Dead 1 was essentially a montage of emotionally evocative scenes, and this one starts in much the same fashion. Communicating its point through imagery and insinuation, which is what Christian propaganda does best. But as the movie unfolds, it drifts away from that strategy and toward an artless practice of just writing the filmmaker's opinions into the mouth of characters. In fact, the entire more than second half of the movie pretty much just uses the trial as a platform for characters to deliver long, editorializing sermons about whatever Pure Flix thinks about church and state and the role of Christians in public life. Now, I'm sure evangelicals might find some of it satisfying, but there are a couple problems here. First, lectures are never as fun as movies, and if Christians were actually interested in sermons, they could always just start paying attention in church. And second, the courtroom scenes don't deliver anything different from the talking points Christians have already been repeating to each other for years, so they really don't bring anything new to the table. Seriously, the end of this movie feels like I'm a kid again, listening to adults from church sit around in the next room griping about prayer getting taken out of schools, and separation of church and state not being in the Constitution. So why would anybody pay to hear characters say it in the same way in a movie? If you're going to forsake cinematic artistry and take the lazy path of having characters just talk, They'd better say something really punchy and insightful, or you're going to lose your audience in a hurry. Now yes, God's Not Dead 1 had its debate scenes, but these were concise, superficial, and spread out among other scenes. And they were mostly there to contribute to the escalating tension between Josh and Radisson that was the real source of drama. By contrast, this movie parks on its presentations for way too long and makes their substance the central point of the conflict. But this is already bleeding into the next problem, which is... 3. It sets up the wrong conflict in the wrong setting. Now at a glance, this might sound backward. After all, a courtroom drama seems like a natural setting for a movie like this, right? The God's Not Dead movies are all about Christian persecution. So you see mean Professor Radisson making people write, God is dead and abusing the guy who won't, and you're like, that's not right. Somebody should stop him. You see a teacher facing legal retribution and the loss of her job just for saying Jesus in the classroom, and you're like, hey, those lawyers shouldn't do that. The dramatic tension comes from seeing a good person put in an unjust situation, if you buy into the premises of the movies, that is, and wanting to see it made right. And since part of what's so galling is that bad guys are acting with impunity with a law on their side, it seems like the natural way to make it right is to take them to court, explain why what they're doing is wrong, and fix it. Intuitively, it makes sense, but I'd argue that taking this route basically doomed this movie from the start by putting it in a position where it had to make an explicit argument for what Christians should be allowed to do in the public sphere. Now you might think that's what this movie would want to do, and in fact, since it's ostensibly addressing the legal rights of Christians in real life, that would seem like the whole point. But here's the thing. The filmmakers, like most evangelicals who make these kinds of arguments, are totally full of and I'm not just saying that as an insult. I'm pointing out a simple fact, which is that there's a huge disparity between what they're pretending to argue for, which is that Christians should have the right to converse normally and be treated as equals, especially in educational settings, and what they're really pushing for, which is for Christianity to be given preferential treatment and some measure of theocratic control in public schools. This presents them with an impossible dilemma. On one hand, they can argue for the right to do the first thing, but they gain no ground by winning this argument, since we already agree with them about this point and the whole conflict is imaginary. On the other hand, they can argue for the second, but they know they can't just come out and demand this, which is why they try to pretend they're arguing for the first thing to begin with. So fleshing out actual hypothetical arguments on the big screen is a dangerous game for them. Part of the genius of God's Not Dead 1, and yes, something inside me died when I said those words, is that it bypassed this problem by not arguing anything about persecution. The central question was not whether Professor Radisson should have been able to treat Josh the way he did. Everybody knows he shouldn't have. 
In the real world, practically any college, government institution, or even real-life atheist would have agreed from the start that he should have been fired and or sued, so the filmmakers would have gained no ground arguing against the pretend persecution they were depicting. Even worse, staging a proceeding in which his behavior came to light and was widely defended would come off as so absurd that the movie would risk revealing how full of shit it was. Thus it just avoided putting itself in a position of having to answer this question to resolve its main conflict, and it did this by simply pretending that any of the institutions that would have thrown Radisson on his ass for his behavior simply didn't exist. This provided the ongoing specter of persecution without forcing the movie to resolve the fruitless question, should Radisson be allowed to do this? Instead, its dramatic focus was on the question, can Josh persevere, and on the promised satisfaction of watching him stand strong in his faith. This creates a narrative Christians can really enjoy, and it keeps the story from getting tangled in the logical contradictions that comes from a premise that's nonsense. God's Not Dead 2, however, chose to show its fantasy persecution scenario being exposed to the public, calling for a resolution in court. When it did this, it was forced to choose between fruitlessly arguing against non-existent persecution or actually owning its real agenda. The fact that the filmmakers wrote themselves into this position is baffling to me and it seems that they, by necessity, reacted by spending the prolonged courtroom time they'd given themselves trying to dance around the issues they'd brought to the surface, leading to a main conflict that ran all over the map so aimlessly that it lost any dramatic focus and totally derailed the movie. This leads us to the final point, which is... Well, 4. The entire conflict ran all over the map so aimlessly that it lost any dramatic focus and totally derailed the movie. The most remarkable thing about the resolution of God's Not Dead 1 was its simplicity. Yes, it had its debates, but they were nothing more than a plot device that allowed Josh to win little victories while pushing Radisson to the breaking point. They didn't give the movie anything that had to be resolved, and in fact what was being argued didn't matter in the slightest, because the writers could have copied and pasted any number of basic, interchangeable apologetics into Josh's mouth, and it would have been equally easy to show Radisson being perplexed in the class declaring Josh the winner. The ideas were of no consequence whatsoever. When you think about it, the resolution was as simple as letting characters who face some form of persecution or another run to a place of emotional release. The movie seemed almost crassly aware of what Christians want and what the religion is to them. An emotional high generated by a well-crafted musical experience and the validation of other people sharing it with you. You know, that thing they call God's presence. God's not dead, he's so it literally just wrapped things up by sending everybody to an environment where they could get hyped up and feel high on Jesus, then called it a day. And this works because the audience, largely comprised of evangelicals who consider their problems solved by cathartic one-time emotional experiences in which they drop their sins or their problems with God's feet and feel reborn, experiences the light show and rousing music along with them, and thus feels the illusion of victory along with them. Now to copy that wise man once more, you might not have known this was how the movie was being resolved, but your brain did. But the key here is the simplicity of the whole thing. The concert was more than an incidental setting for the resolution. It was the resolution. Literally all the filmmakers did was show distressing scenes of people being persecuted, and then a happy scene of them at a concert. And their actual problems were either resolved in a superficial way, such as with Josh, or not at all, such as with Martin and Aisha. The way it ignores practical steps toward problem solving while just throwing an emotional experience at people makes this the most profoundly appropriate end for an evangelical movie. It's brilliant in its straightforward emotional appeal and shows the movie knows its audience. God's Not Dead 2, however, takes the opposite track of getting bogged down in procedure and factual discussion. Worse, as I said previously, the filmmakers put themselves in a position of having to flesh out ideas they ultimately wanted to obscure. So how does the movie respond to being in this position? By doing the only thing it could. Bounce all over the place to avoid taking these ideas to their logical conclusion. And in the process it loses all sense of dramatic or even intellectual focus, until it becomes so unbearable that it probably even lost its hyper-receptive Christian audience. Seriously, this trial went into so many inexplicably weird, random places, it's simply baffling. In fact, I tracked them all just so we can see how incomprehensible this trial was. 
First, in the opening argument, the prosecution made some general statements about religion in the classroom and presented the simplified argument that when your answer to a question shows you're familiar with a religion scripture, it sounds like an endorsement and is in fact preaching. Side note, Mr. I hate everything you stand for tosses in this obsequious apology to Muslims just to make it clear he's only picking on Christians. I, I don't mean to offend anyone who may be a Muslim here, and I do not want to slight the prophet of Islam. The defense said the word separation of church and state is not in the Constitution, which we all know and isn't relevant to anything, and that the phrase has been twisted out of context in recent years. He goes on to say that all Grace did was answer a question. She hadn't preached, hadn't prayed before class, didn't have a Bible out, and so on. Next, the dad was brought to the stand. Under prosecution questioning, he basically said he wanted his daughter to be a free thinker, and I guess that her hearing the word Jesus ruined that. The defense had no questions, and this whole thing was pointless and just showed the dad being duplicitous about his real motivations. Then came Mrs. Rizzo. You know, the what were you thinking, Grace lady. Under prosecution questioning, she said that Grace always shares her faith, everybody knows she's a Christian, and it's awkward, quipping, she won't chew a stick of gum without praying first. The defense asked her for actual specific examples, and of course she couldn't give any. Finally for that day, we had the school's principal. The prosecution asked a pointless question about why they're dealing with this in court, which, all right. Then the defense asked whether the principal would allow a teacher to use the same points from the Bible that Martin Luther King uses as illustrations. She said no because they're too controversial. On redirect, she tells the prosecution that Grace invited her to a church event to honor students for community service while on school property and, in response to an extremely leading question which is weird because she was his witness, that Grace accepts donations for a faith-based charity in the classroom. At this point, the trial adjourns for the day, so let's break down what happened so far. Because believe it or not, this is by far the most sane part of the proceedings, and what we've seen is telling. Basically, if you look over these points, you'll notice that no progress was made to delve into the question of whether Grace had done anything illegal. The lawyer's openings involve rudimentary, and, let's generously say imprecise, explanations about the separation of church and state that are at best loosely and often farcically connected to the incident at hand. Then Tom clarifies that Grace wasn't proselytizing and had just answered a question, which is the only relevant point made so far, so any real trial would have zeroed in on this fact and, unless witnesses contested it, quickly absolved Grace of any wrongdoing. But the problem is this is dangerous territory the movie can't dwell on, because Tom is justifying her on the grounds that she didn't do things Christians want teachers to be able to do, and only did things they already can do. So instead, the movie abandons the actual case and just wanders off into testimony about other stuff, including a series of unrelated allegations, each of which it dances around for a moment before abandoning it without exploring whether it constituted a church state violation or was even true. Seriously, think of all the questions left hanging here. Is Grace really always sharing her faith at school? How often is this directed at her students in her capacity as a teacher? Exactly what did her acts of eliciting donations or inviting people to an event at a church look like, and did she present them in a way that endorsed religion? How might a teacher's emphasis on and approach to religious illustrations from people like Martin Luther King start to cross over a blurred line from literary analysis to religious instruction? If this movie explored these questions to any extent whatsoever, it would have developed a narrative flow and actually fleshed out a concrete stance. And better yet, the court proceedings would have made sense. But here's the problem. It can't, because doing so would require it to either settle for too little or reveal its actual agenda. Thus it just keeps all testimony speculative or, in the case of MLK, irrelevantly hypothetical, and just uses these questions to float insinuations. It insinuates teachers can't even answer a question about Jesus, while remaining vague about how far they should be allowed to go. It insinuates teachers can't use any religious reference by historical figures like King, which is absurd, by the way, and many common public school textbooks include Christian allusions and even full essays or sermons as part of their survey of Western literary history, while remaining vague about how far teachers should be allowed to lean into these illustrations, or how much it would tolerate the same from, for example, Muslim literature. In the process, by the way, it conflates approval of King using religion in his personal writings with approval of teachers using religion in a classroom, which is a totally irrelevant comparison. 
It floats accusations of her talking about Jesus, taking donations for charities that, ahem, ahem, happen to be Christian, and inviting people to civic events that, ahem, ahem, happen to be at a church, but it's so desperate to remain vague about what these activities look like that it takes the weird path of having the court just never ask about them further, which gives the audience room to assume she can't make a mild peep about anything Christian while, again, remaining vague about what the movie wants her to be able to do. Now, of course, these movies want to be vague. They want to deal with insinuation. But if that's your approach, you shouldn't set up factual questions in a trial. Because when you keep bringing them up and then just dropping them without any kind of payoff, you're repeatedly pulling the rug out from under your audience, creating a narrative with no cohesion, dramatic flow, or sense of who's winning or losing. I think that's a big part of what makes this so tedious. It seems that at this point the filmmakers realized they had nowhere to go, so they just panicked and derailed the trial with what might be the biggest, weirdest change of subject ever by having Tom and Grace for some reason decide it would be fruitful to prove the historicity of Jesus in court. This, of course, is totally irrelevant and has no bearing on whether Grace's actions were legal. You're equally free to quote Jesus in a historical context, whether it's as a real person or a literary character, making this whole line of argument such a head-scratching farce that it's outlandish even by the standards of this movie. I mean, you can quote something Hamlet said whether or not he was a real person, because even if he's not, you're just implicitly referring to the ideas of the author who wrote his lines. For real. Does this movie have this low an estimation of its audience? Well, apparently so, because the next thing we see is Lee Strobel on the stand, seemingly the next morning, which is remarkably quick, as this courtroom drama escalates from tediously irrelevant to bizarre fever dream. The defense asks Strobel if he can prove Jesus was real, and he makes the embarrassing, even by his standard, argument that the dating system we use proves Jesus before running through some standard, vague apologetics. The prosecution just kind of sits there and sulks before saying no questions, because in the eyes of this movie, Strobel just conclusively dunked on every atheist who ever lived. Next, we're subjected to Strobel's fellow charlatan, J. Warner Wallace. The defense prompts Wallace to go on and on, pretending that he can prove Bible stories are true, using facts that are from those same stories. The prosecutor asks about discrepancies between the Gospels, and Wallace says this actually shows the accounts are reliable which I guess is handy for Christians because it means the Bible is reliable no matter what it says. Eventually, Wallace says he was a devout atheist, you know, the way atheists talk, and Cain stands there baffled like he's never seen anyone pull the I used to be an atheist card. Then the camera points to all the atheists who of course look totally defeated. Now let's be clear about a couple things here. First, there are actual qualifications for expert witnesses, and the very idea that any court of law would ever suffer clowns like Strobel or Wallace to take the stand and pretend that having been a journalist or a detective qualifies them to speak to ancient textual criticism in any capacity whatsoever, much less deduce that Jesus must have been real, is just an absolute insulting farce. Second, the sheer irrelevance of this tangent completely derails the already questionable dramatic momentum of this trial. I mean, sure, Christians might like the individual ways this movie is pandering to them. They might like melodrama about a teacher not being allowed to say Jesus in school, and they might like stage plays that depict atheists being pwned by stupid apologetics. But you have to maintain a sense of dramatic flow. And if you set up a thing about a teacher on trial for saying Jesus but then suddenly switch to the apologetic stage play, your audience is going to get lost and then bored. Even if they buy the thin rationale for bringing apologetics into the courtroom, it's a drastic shift in tone and it feels like the real dramatic question is getting set aside. But apparently this hasn't been enough chaos, because suddenly Brooke bursts into the courtroom and shouts over the judge until he lets her testify, which... (sighs) Okay, whatever. She testifies for the defense that she was the one who brought up the name of Jesus as part of a question, and her teacher just gave a normal answer. Then the prosecution asks a series of questions that leads to the big revelation that Grace had shared her faith with her in the coffee shop. Now this brings three questions to mind. First, why was this outburst tolerated? Second, why was this kind of testimony not the focal point of the trial from the start? Seriously, this has been the only directly relevant testimony so far. I mean, the event in question literally happened in front of a room full of witnesses, but we're to believe it never occurred to the court to quickly and easily get to the bottom of things by having some of them testify? This is a major problem. 
You can't dangle a central dramatic point with an obvious solution in front of your audience, but then keep talking about other stuff. Even if they don't consciously know it, they're going to feel like everything you're doing is an irrelevant distraction. And third, why are the filmmakers yanking our chains yet again? The first day of testimony was about rumors of other things Grace might have done, along with some vague philosophical questions. Yet the movie just drops them. It then switches gears to the historicity of Jesus and tells us that will solve the case. And while this is nonsense and a giant shift in topic and tone, if you're going to set it up as the solution to the plot, then commit to it. I mean, f***ing commit to something already. But the movie can't even do that. Instead, it derails itself again by having Brooke run in and bring our attention to... Hmm... What the case had been about all along. From a writing standpoint, this is absolute insanity. Any coherent plot should establish a central question, then use rising action to build toward an anticipated climax. The implicit promise this makes to your audience is that the tension you're creating is related to this central question and will be resolved in this climax. That's the payoff on the whole point of most stories. But this movie is so desperate to remain elusive about what it's trying to say that it keeps setting up different lines of rising action most of which are related to the central question in only the most tenuous ways, and then abandoning them and starting all over. Will allegations about grace on day one be found to be true and constitute impropriety? We don't know because the movie ditches this question. Will Jesus' historicity get her off the hook? We don't know because the movie ditches this question. Even worse, this last interruption brings us back to the very place the movie had created all these rabbit trails to avoid in the first place which means now it's back to Grace's two actions, and it has to pick between defending something pointless or pushing an agenda it doesn't want to own up to. And of course it's not going to do this, so once more it pitches everything out the window and redirects us with yet another outburst. This time Tom bursts in and calls Grace to the stand as a hostile witness, which is stupid for way too many reasons to go into here, and then concludes the movie and, spoiler alert, wins the case with a really bizarre stunt that I can only describe as passive-aggressively berating her for being a Christian, in which he says, I think it's time that we stop pretending that we can trust a person like this to serve in a public capacity. In the name of tolerance and diversity, I say we destroy her. Then we can all go to our graves content, knowing that we stomped out the last spark of faith that was ever exhibited in the public square. I say we make an example of her. Let's set a new precedent. That employment by our federal government mandates that you must first announce any belief system you have. And if someone slips through the cracks and, and, and hides their beliefs, then we arrest them and fine them. And if they don't pay, then we seize their property. And if they resist, oh, well, let's not kid ourselves. Enforcement is always at the end of a gun. Okay, maybe this last point isn't quite as made up as the rest, because I guess technically enforcement of any law is at the end of a gun if you resist enough. But this movie's audience is far from the demographic most often having guns pointed at it in our society, if you catch my drift. So this just comes off as extremely self-absorbed and tone-deaf, and it just escalates the utter hysteria of everything else Tom is saying. So what even was this? In order to get our heads around this bizarre ending, it might help if I describe a common interaction I find myself having with Christians. In short, when I try to address issues of personal boundaries or conversational decency, for example, please stop telling my children I'm on the side of darkness, or it would be nice if you didn't use grandpa's funeral as an opportunity to say I agree without hope, the Christian will often respond with some version of, I'm still going to follow Christ no matter what you say, it's my right to go to church, or you can't make me give up my faith. Of course, this is a total non sequitur. As far as I can tell, it's just a refusal to engage with or even hear your concerns by construing any basic expectation of fair social discourse as an attack on them and their faith. This is exactly what this movie does. It seems to be aware that people have concerns about how public school teachers use their position to influence children and is ostensibly there to address these concerns. But after a lot of random, disorganized back and forth, what's its ultimate point? What's it trying to say? In the end, Literally all it does is ignore these actual concerns and just shout that the world is demanding that they stop being Christians and will persecute them if they try. If we're going to insist that a Christian's right to believe is subordinate to all other rights, then it's not a right. 
That's literally this movie's concluding message on in-school proselytizing. In a way, it makes sense, being the entire message of this franchise and all, but it's not a reaction to what this movie is about. It's just a change of subject. Of course, it's also a flagrantly stupid lie. But the real challenge for this movie is it's a blunt lie, a single assertion so basic that there's no way to expound upon it, and so untrue there's no way to demonstrate it. All you can do is just say that it's true through passive-aggressive jabs or, I guess, a shouty rant. The only way to sustain this idea is to do what the first movie did and just betray it in an isolated environment where you can make everything up without having to reconcile your absurd ideas with each other or reality. But God's Not Dead 2 flew too close to the sun by actually trying to, or pretending to, unpack and intellectually explore what's essentially a one-line lie. This resulted in it flailing all over the place, turning into a chaotic mess, and ultimately plunging into the water before desperately having Tom shout the one basic point it wanted to make all along. Hopefully Pureflix never learns its lesson, which is this. If you're full of s*** and trying to pander to an insular audience, just keep it simple. This program was made possible by a grant from John Adams, Bob Generic, Maggie Danger, S.R. Foxley, A Little Logic, Daniel Bostet, Nidemos, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.